And we're back. Welcome to another World Audiobooks. Thank you guys for tuning in. Starting a brand new chapter here with Arsene Lupin versus Herlock Sholmes. I am loving this book. Hope you guys are as well. Uh, apologize for the bit of noise in the background. I have just sweated myself almost to death. Um, so I'm treating myself to a little bit of fan action here for the intro and outro. I didn't think you guys would mind. The, uh, yeah, having to keep fans off in this weather um, while recording is, has been quite, uh, quite <laughs> interesting. Uh, but I will sign sacrifice for you guys because I want to bring you this chapter and uh, I'm so happy to be able to do it so thank you guys for listening huge shout out to all of our patrons if you want to become a patron and uh, boost us up to that 12 patron mark uh, then I will stop chopping up chapters don't want to be doing that uh, but need your help to, to get to that point and if you can't contribute if you can't sign up as a patron no worries at all like I always say um, there's somebody out there who will sign up as a patron and I just need you to go tell them about the podcast so spread the word about the podcast and that helps us grow and helps me to continue to bring you awesome free audiobooks. So speaking of which, let's get to it. Without further ado, I give you the next installment of Arsene Lupin versus Herlock Sholmes. Chapter 7. The Jewish Lamp. Herlock Sholmes and Wilson were sitting in front of the fireplace, in comfortable armchairs, with the feet extended toward the grateful warmth of a glowing coke fire. Sholmes's pipe, a short briar with a silver band, had gone out. He knocked out the ashes, filled it, lighted it, pulled the skirts of his dressing gown over his knees, and drew from his pipe great puffs of smoke, which ascended toward the ceiling in scores of shadow rings. Wilson gazed at him, as a dog lying curled up on a rug before the fire might look at his master, with great round eyes which have no hope other than to obey the least gesture of his owner. Was the master going to break the silence? Would he reveal to Wilson the subject of his reverie, and admit his satellite into the charmed realm of his thoughts? When Sholmes had maintained his silent attitude for some time, Wilson ventured to speak. Everything seems quiet now, not the shadow of a case to occupy our leisure moments. Sholmes did not reply, but the rings of smoke emitted by Sholmes were better formed, and Wilson observed that his companion drew considerable pleasure from that trifling fact an indication that the great man was not absorbed in any serious meditation. Wilson, discouraged, arose and went to the window. The lonely street extended between the gloomy facades of grimy houses. Unusually gloomy this morning by reason of a heavy downfall of rain. A cab passed, then another. Wilson made an entry of their numbers in his memorandum book. One never knows. Ah! he exclaimed. The postman! The man entered, shown in by the servant. Two register letters, sir, if you will sign, please. Sholmes signed the receipts, accompanied the man to the door, and was opening one of the letters as he returned. It seems to please you, remarked Wilson after a moment's silence. This letter contains a very interesting proposition. You are anxious for a case? Here's one. Read. Wilson read. Monsieur, I desire the benefit of your services and experience. I have been the victim of a serious theft, and the investigation has as yet been unsuccessful. I am sending to you by this mail a number of newspapers which will inform you of the affair, and if you will undertake the case, I will place my house at your disposal and ask you to fill in the enclosed check, signed by me, for whatever sum you require for your expenses. Kindly reply by telegraph, and much oblige, your humble servant, Baron Victor d'Ambleval, 18 Rue Murillo, Paris. Ah, exclaimed Sholmes, that sounds good. A little trip to Paris, and why not, Wilson? Since my famous duel with Arsène Lupin, I have not had an excuse to go there. I should be pleased to visit the capital of the world under less strenuous conditions. He tore the check into four pieces, and while Wilson, whose arm had not yet regained its former strength, uttered bitter words against Paris and the Parisians, Sholmes opened the second envelope. Immediately, he made a gesture of annoyance, and a wrinkle appeared on his forehead during the reading of the letter. Then, crushing the paper into a ball, he threw it angrily on the floor. "'Well, what's the matter?' asked Wilson anxiously. He picked up the ball of paper— unfolded it, and read with increasing amazement. My dear monsieur, you know full well the admiration I have for you, and the interest I take in your renown. 
Well, believe me when I warn you to have nothing whatever to do with the case on which you have just now been called to Paris. Your intervention will cause much harm. Your efforts will produce a most lamentable result, and you will be obliged to make a public confession of your defeat. Having a sincere desire to spare you such humiliation, I implore you, in the name of the friendship that unites us, to remain peacefully reposing at your own fireside. My best wishes to Monsieur Wilson, and for yourself, the sincere regards of your devoted Arsène Lupin. Arsène Lupin! repeated Wilson, astounded. Sholmes struck the table with his fist and exclaimed, Ah, he is pestering me already, the fool! He laughs at me as if I were a schoolboy! The public confession of my defeat! Didn't I force him to disgorge the blue diamond? I tell you, he's afraid, suggested Wilson. Nonsense. Arsene Lupin is not afraid, and this taunting letter proves it. But how did he know that the Baron d'Ambleval had written to you? What do I know about it? You do ask some stupid questions, my boy. I thought... I, I supposed... What? That I am a clairvoyant? Or a sorcerer? No, but I have seen you do some marvellous things. No person can perform marvellous things. I know more than you. I reflect, I deduct, I conclude. That is all. But I do not divine. Only fools divine. Wilson assumed the attitude of a whipped cur, and resolved not to make a fool of himself by trying to divine why Sholmes paced the room with quick, nervous strides. But when Sholmes rang for the servant and ordered his valise, Wilson thought that he was in possession of a material fact which gave him the right to reflect, deduct, and conclude that his associate was about to take a journey. The same mental operation permitted him to assert, with almost mathematical exactness, Sholmes, you are going to Paris? Possibly. And Lupin's affront impels you to go, rather than the desire to assist the Baron d'Ambleval? Possibly. Sholmes, I shall go with you. Ah, uh -uh, my old friend, exclaimed Sholmes, interrupting his walking. You are not afraid that your right arm will meet the same fate as your left? What can happen to me? You will be there. That's the way to talk, Wilson. We will show that clever Frenchman that he has made a mistake when he threw his glove in our faces. Be quick, Wilson. We must catch the first train. Without waiting for the papers the Baron has sent you? What good are they? I will send a telegram. No. If you do that, Arsene Lupin will know of my arrival. I wish to avoid that. This time, Wilson, we must fight under cover. That afternoon, the two friends embarked at Dover. The passage was a delightful one. In the train from Calais to Paris, Sholmes had three hours sound sleep, while Wilson guarded the door of the compartment. Sholmes awoke in good spirits. He was delighted at the idea of another duel with Arsène Lupin, and he rubbed his hands with the satisfied air of a man who looks forward to a pleasant vacation. At last! exclaimed Wilson. We are getting to work again! And he rubbed his hands in the same satisfied air. At the station, Sholmes took the wraps, and, followed by Wilson, who carried the valises, he gave up his tickets and started off briskly. Fine weather, Wilson. Blue sky and sunshine. Paris is giving us a royal reception. Yes, but what a crowd! So much the better, Wilson. We will pass unnoticed. No one will recognize us in such a crowd. Is this Monsieur Sholmes? He stopped, somewhat puzzled. Who the deuce could thus address him by his name? A woman stood beside him, a young girl whose simple dress outlined her slender form, and whose pretty face had a sad and anxious expression. She repeated her inquiry. You are Monsieur Sholmes? As he still remained silent, as much from confusion as from a habit of prudence, the girl asked a third time. Have I the honor of addressing Monsieur Sholmes? What do you want? He replied testily, considering the incident a suspicious one. You must listen to me, Monsieur Sholmes, as it is a serious matter. I know that you are going to the Rue Murillo. What do you say? I know, I know. Rue Murillo, number 18. Well, you must not go. No, you must not. 
I assure you that you will regret it. Do not think that I have any interest in the matter. I do it because it is right, because my conscience tells me to do it. Sholmes tried to get away, but she persisted. Oh, I beg you, don't neglect my advice. Oh, if I only knew how to convince you. Look at my eyes. Look into my eyes. They are sincere. They speak the truth. She gazed at Sholmes, fearlessly but innocently, with those beautiful eyes, serious and clear, in which her very soul seemed to be reflected. Wilson nodded his head as he said, Mademoiselle looks honest. Yes, she implored. And you must have confidence. I have confidence in you, Mademoiselle, replied Wilson. Oh, how happy you make me, and so has your friend. I feel it, I am sure of it. What happiness, everything will be all right now. What a good idea of mine. Ah, yes, there is a train for Calais in twenty minutes. You will take it. Quick, follow me. You must come this way, there is just time. She tried to drag them along. Sholm seized her arm, and in as gentle a voice as he could assume, he said to her, Excuse me, mademoiselle, if I cannot yield to your wishes, but I never abandon a task that I have once undertaken. I beseech you, I implore you, if you could only understand. Sholmes passed outside and walked away at a quick pace. Wilson said to the girl, Have no fear, he will be in at the finish. He never failed yet and he ran to overtake Sholmes. Herlock Sholmes, Arsene Lupin. These words, in great black letters, met their gaze as soon as they left the railway station. A number of sandwich men were parading through the street, one behind the other, carrying heavy canes with iron ferrules with which they struck the pavement in harmony, and on their backs they carried large posters on which one could read the following notice. The match between Herlock Sholmes and Arsene Lupin, arrival of the English champion, the great detective attacks the mystery of the Rue Murillo. Read the details in the Echo de France. Wilson shook his head and said, Look at that, Sholmes, and we thought we were travelling incognito. I shouldn't be surprised to find the Republican Guard waiting for us at the Rue Murillo to give us an official reception with toast and champagne. Wilson, when you get funny, you get beastly funny, growled Sholmes. Then he approached one of the sandwich men with the obvious intention of seizing him in his powerful grip and crushing him together with his infernal signboard. There was quite a crowd gathered about the men, reading the notices and joking and laughing. Repressing a furious access of rage, Sholmes said to the man, When did they hire you? This morning. How long have you been parading? About an hour. But the boards were ready before that? Oh yes, they were ready when we went to the agency this morning. So then, it appears that Arsene Lupin had foreseen that he, Sholmes, would accept the challenge. More than that, the letter written by Lupin showed that he was eager for the fray, and that he was prepared to measure swords once more with his formidable rival. Why? What motive could Arsene Lupin have in renewing the struggle? Sholmes hesitated for a moment. Lupin must be very confident of his success to show so much insolence in advance. And was not he, Sholmes, falling into a trap by rushing into the battle at the first call for help? However, he called a carriage. Come, Wilson. Driver, 18 Rue Murillo, he exclaimed with an outburst of his accustomed energy with distended veins and clenched fists, as if he were about to engage in a boxing bout, he jumped into the carriage. The Rue Murillo is bordered with magnificent private residences, the rear of which overlook the Parc Monceau. One of the most pretentious of these houses is number 18, owned and occupied by the Baron Dom Bluval, and furnished in a luxurious manner, consistent with the owner's taste and wealth. There was a courtyard in front of the house, and in the rear, a garden well filled with trees whose branches mingle with those of the park. After ringing the bell, the two Englishmen were admitted, crossed the courtyard, and there received at the door by a footman who showed them into a small parlour, facing the garden in the rear of the house. They sat down and, glancing about, made a rapid inspection of the many valuable objects with which the room was filled. 
Everything very choice, murmured Wilson. And in the best of taste, it is a safe deduction to make that those who had the leisure to collect these articles must now be at least fifty years of age. The door opened, and the Baron Don Bluval entered, followed by his wife. Contrary to the deduction made by Wilson, they were both quite young, of elegant appearance, and vivacious in speech and action. They were profuse in their expressions of gratitude. So kind of you to come. Sorry to have caused you so much trouble. The theft now seems of little consequence, since it has procured us this pleasure. How charming these French people are, thought Wilson, involving one of his commonplace deductions. But time is money, exclaimed the Baron. Especially your time, Monsieur Sholmes. So I will come to the point. Now, what do you think of the affair? Do you think you can succeed in it? Before I can answer, I must know what it is about. I thought you knew. No. So I must ask you for full particulars, even to the smallest detail. First, what is the nature of the case? A theft. When did it take place? Last Saturday, replied the Baron. Or, at least, some time during Saturday night or Sunday morning. That was six days ago. Now... You can tell me all about it. In the first place, monsieur, I must tell you that my wife and I, conforming to the manner of life that our position demands, go out very little. The education of our children, a few receptions, and the care and decoration of our house, such constitutes our life, and nearly all our evenings are spent in this little room, which is my wife's boudoir, and in which we have gathered a few artistic objects. Last Saturday night, about eleven o'clock, I turned off the electric lights, and my wife and I retired, as usual, to our room. Where is your room? It adjoins this. That is the door. The next morning, that is to say, Sunday morning, I arose quite early. As Suzanne, my wife, was still asleep, I passed into the boudoir as quietly as possible, so as not to wake her. What was my astonishment when I found that window open, as we had left it closed the evening before? A servant? No one enters here in the morning until we ring. Besides, I always take the precaution to bolt the second door which communicates with the antechamber. Therefore, the window must have been opened from the outside. Besides, I have some evidence of that. The second pane of glass from the right, close to the fastening, had been cut. And what does that window overlook? As you can see for yourself, it opens on a little balcony, surrounded by a stone railing. Here we are on the first floor, and you can see the garden behind the house and the iron fence which separates it from the Parc Monceau. It is quite certain that the thief came through the park, climbed the fence by aid of a ladder, and thus reached the terrace below the window. That is quite certain, you say? Well... In the soft earth on either side of the fence, they found the two holes made by the bottom of the latter, and two similar holes can be seen below the window, and the stone railing of the balcony shows two scratches, which were doubtless made by the contact of the latter. Is the park moon so closed at night? No, but if it were, there is a house in course of erection at number 14, and the person could enter that way. Herlock Sholmes reflected for a few minutes, and then said, Let us come down to the theft. It must have been committed in this room? Yes, there was here, beneath that twelfth-century virgin and that tabernacle of a chased silver, a small Jewish lamp. It has disappeared. And is that all? That is all. Ah, huh. and what is a Jewish lamp? One of those copper lamps, used by the ancient Jews, consisting of a standard which supported a bowl containing the oil, and from this bowl projected several burners intended for the wicks. Upon the whole, an object of small value. No great value, of course, but this one contained a secret hiding place in which we were accustomed to place a magnificent jewel, a chimera in gold set with rubies and emeralds, which was of great value. Why did you hide it there? Oh, I can't give any reason, monsieur, unless it was an odd fancy to utilize a hiding place of that kind. Did anyone know it? No. No one except the thief. 
said Sholmes. Otherwise, he would not have taken the trouble to steal the lamp. Of course, but how he could know it, as it was only by accident that the secret mechanism of the lamp was revealed to us. A similar accident has revealed it to someone else, a servant or an acquaintance. But let us proceed. I suppose the police have been notified? Yes, the examining magistrate has completed his investigation. The reporter detectives attached to the leading newspapers have also made their investigations, but as I wrote you, it seems to me the mystery will never be solved. Sholmes arose, went to the window, examined the casement, the balcony, the terrace, studied the scratches on the stone railing with his magnifying glass, and then requested Monsieur Dom Blouval to show him the garden. Outside, Sholmes sat down in a rattan chair and gazed at the roof of the house in a dreamy way. Then he walked over to the two little wooden boxes with which they had covered the holes made in the ground by the bottom of the ladder, with a view of preserving them intact. He raised the boxes, kneeled on the ground, scrutinized the holes and made some measurements. After making a similar examination of the holes near the fence, he and the Baron returned to the boudoir, where Madame d'Ambleuvan was waiting for them. After a short silence, Sholmes said, At the very outset of your story, Baron, I was surprised at the very simple methods employed by the thief. To raise a ladder, cut a window pane, select a valuable article, and walk out again. No, that is not the way such things are done. All that is too plain, too simple. Well, what do you think? That the Jewish lamp was stolen under the direction of Arsène Lupin. Arsène Lupin! exclaimed the Baron. Yes, but he did not do it himself, as no one came from the outside. Perhaps a servant descended from the upper floor by means of a water spout that I noticed when I was in the garden. What makes you think so? Arsène Lupin would not leave this room empty handed. Empty handed? But he had the lamp! But that would not have prevented his taking that snuff box set with diamonds or that opal necklace. When he leaves anything, it is because he can't carry it away. But the marks of the ladder outside? A false scent, placed there simply to avert suspicion. And the scratches on the balustrade? A farce. They were made by a piece of sandpaper. See, here are scraps of paper that I picked up in the garden. And what about the marks made by the bottom of the ladder? Counterfeit. Examine the two rectangular holes below the window, and the two holes near the fence. They are of similar form, but I find that the two holes near the house are closer to each other than the two holes near the fence. What does that fact suggest? To me, it suggested that the four holes were made by a piece of wood prepared for the purpose. A better proof would be the piece of wood itself. Here it is, said Sholmes. I found it in the garden, under the box of a laurel tree. The Baron bowed to Sholmes in recognition of his skill. Only forty minutes had elapsed since the Englishman had entered the house, and he had already exploded all the theories theretofore formed, and which had been based on what appeared to be obvious and undeniable facts. But what now appeared to be the real facts of the case rested upon a more solid foundation, to wit, the astute reasoning of a Herlock Sholmes. The accusation which you make against one of our household is a very serious matter, said the Baroness. Our servants have been with us a long time, and none of them would betray our trust. If none of them has betrayed you, how can you explain the fact that I received this letter on the same day and by the same mail as the letter you wrote to me? He handed to the Baroness the letter that he had received from Arsène Lupin. She exclaimed in amazement, Arsène Lupin, how could he know? Did you tell anyone that you had written to me? No one, replied the Baron. The idea occurred to us the other evening at the dinner table. But the servants? No, only our two children. Oh no, Sophie and Henriette had left the table, hadn't they, Suzanne? Madame d'Ambleuval, after a moment's reflection, replied, Yes, they had gone to Mademoiselle. Mademoiselle? queried Sholmes. The governess, Mademoiselle Alice Dumont. Does she take her meals with you? No, her meals are served in her room. Wilson had an idea. He said, The letter written to my friend Herlock Sholmes was posted. Of course. 
Who posted it? Dominique, who has been my valet for twenty years, replied the Baron. Any search in that direction would be a waste of time. One never wastes his time when engaged in a search, said Wilson sententiously. This preliminary investigation now ended, and Sholmes asked permission to retire. At dinner, an hour later, he saw Sophie and Henriette, the two children of the family. One was six, and the other eight years of age. There was very little conversation at the table. Sholmes responded to the friendly advances of his hosts in such a curt manner that they were soon reduced to silence. When the coffee was served, Sholmes swallowed the contents of his cup and rose to take his leave. At that moment, a servant entered with a telephone message, addressed to Sholmes. He opened it and read, "'You have my enthusiastic admiration. The results attained by you in so short a time are simply marvellous. I am dismayed.' Arsene Lupin. Sholmes made a gesture of indignation and handed the message to the Baron, saying, What do you think now, monsieur? Are the walls of your house furnished with eyes and ears? I don't understand it, said the Baron in amazement. Nor do I. But I do understand that Lupin has knowledge of everything that occurs in this house. He knows every movement, every word. There is no doubt of it. But how does he get his information? That is the first mystery I have to solve. And when I know that, I will know everything. I don't know, Sherlock sounded a bit cocky based on the last slapdown he got from Lupin. What do you think? Let me know. I would love to hear from you. There's been some great conversation going on over on the YouTubes, so go check that out, anotherworldaudiobooks.com, uh, and you can click on the YouTube link. Or if you go to another world, or if you go to YouTube uh, and search Another World Audiobooks Podcast, make sure to put in podcast in there, and, and we'll pop right up at the top there for you, easy to find. Uh, we'd love to get some more subscribers over there. Uh, we're, we're getting close to that 1,000 thousand, thousand subscribers remark which would be a great milestone for the podcast and uh and you know with with that kind of thing we might be able to stop chopping up chapters as well so 12 patrons or a thousand youtube subscribers one or the other let's go guys thank you so much for supporting the show and just spreading the word about it i so so appreciate it with that i hope you have a fantastic week and uh we'll talk to you next week